right, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, an idea uh, called schemaless SQL. Uh, it lets you have all the advantages you have of your relational database and some nice document stuff, too. Uh, I'm Will Lineweber. I'm probably, you probably know me best for my amazing gem bundle, which when you install it, installs Bundler. Uh, it's widely popular. Um, but I work at Heroku, Post Heroku on the Postgres team, and we run a lot, a lot of Postgres databases. And uh, I really like Postgres, and I want to tell you some of the cool things you can do with it. Uh, so a little bit of where I'm coming from uh, to explain you know, sort of some of my motivations is uh, I started out with originally doing you know, plain active record, you know, simple CRUD apps, um, and that worked you know, really well for a while. And then I found uh, CouchDB, and I, I fell in love with Couch. It was, it's a really great database. If, uh, have, has any of you guys tried Couch? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, it has some, some great features. The HTTP RESTful-ish interface is nice. MapReduce is, is pretty fun. Uh, but the thing I loved most was the documents. You know, being able to store the things I was dealing with in Ruby it just as a regular document just really felt right. Um, you know, tables, they, they sort of suck. Third normalized form is a pain. And, um, you know, often my data that I'm dealing with, you know, my web applications isn't really relational data, it doesn't fit the model. Spreading, you know, making a, a lot, a lot of tables to, you know, in the pursuit of third normalized form, it just doesn't feel right a lot of the times to me. Um, so the, the, one of the last projects I worked on was a tool where artists could version their songs and then show those versions to their fans. And so this is sort of, you know, how it went. The you know, song had a title, it had a pointer back to the artist, uh, you know, some other metadata there. Each song had uh, versions, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Those versions, you know, had lyrics that could change between versions, the date it was made, stuff like that. Each of these versions had a, a list of tracks, and the tracks had files, and, and so on. And once you get, when I, I was trying to model this, you know, before Couch in, in SQL, I got, I, got a problem when I got down to the file part. It was hard for me to justify having a files table when really a file in and of itself didn't make a whole lot of sense. It only made sense in the context of everything else. And so, I mean, I, I could have done that in SQL, but I, I'm just not smart enough to like keep all of that you know, stuff in my head. And so I did it in Couch, and it, it worked great. Um, but then uh, I came to Heroku and started learning uh, Postgres. And you know, Postgres is it's a fantastic database. Uh, Multi-version concurrency control, the full text search that it has is phenomenal. Um, geolocation, uh, the last version of Postgres has this awesome thing called k-nearest neighbors, where you can say, find me the five things closest to that in, in, it, in on an index, instead of like get, having to get 20 things and boil it down to five. Uh, listen notify built in, uh, the data types are just great. Like on and on and on, I could, I could give a whole talk on great things in Postgres. Um, but the, the best thing that I, I didn't realize I missed so much was transactions and being to ro roll back. Like I'd be, um, now whenever I have a scare migration, I just spin up a fork of my database, you know, and then type begin, run the migration, you know, see if it, if it worked. If it didn't, because I, I never get it right on the first try, I roll back and then try it again until I get it right, throw away that fork database, and then do it on the real one. Like being able to do that just saves so much time, and it's just, it's, it's fantastic. But, you know, I, I, missed, I missed documents. Um, well, that, that, I should say that I missed documents. I, I don't anymore, and I'll tell you why. Uh, two things, HStore and PLV8. One of these you can use today. The other one is sort of uh, cutting edge, not really ready for production, but I think it's really fantastic. Uh, so I'm going to start with HStore. Uh, so HStore gives you a key value column type inside of Postgres. And so you'll have your regular table, and one of the columns will be an HDOR document. Uh, and the, the awesome part is you can have an index on that. Um, how many guys in, in your apps do you have just like a general like serialized table that you just treat, or a serialized column that you just treat as like an opaque thing and you can't really query on? Do any of you guys do that? Yeah, now you, now you can query on it. Okay, so I'm going to show you how HDOR works. And so, so here, here's a query, it's select, and then uh, I have a string, and then I'm casting that string into an HDOR. And so this is just, you know, x is, or a is x, b is y, and then that little uh, single arrow operator, that's an HDOR operator of how to get a key out. And so I'm asking, you know, give me the, the a key, and so I get x out, as you might expect. Uh, another example, um, 
so uh, SQL as a language is, is pretty bad. Uh, and the or operator is actually concat. And so if these, if you concat two um, HROs together, you will overwrite keys that are existing, and any new keys will just show up as new keys. And so here, the B key was overwritten to P, and then C was added. Um, you can also subtract keys out. Uh, they'll only get subtracted if they match uh, specifically. And, uh, and so in this case, uh, the B key, since that matched, that's gone, but the, the, the A still stayed. Um, and that's, that's uh, some basic HStore stuff. There's, there's more and more operators that I'm not going to get into. You can uh, look it up. The Postgres documentation is actually pretty good. Um, but one of the great things you can do is you can use this. Um, this, is, you know, this is how you'd use it you know, in a where clause. So I'm selecting all of my products that um, have the color attribute. So in this case, adders is an HStore column in my table. And I'm pulling out all the ones that are red, and I would get you know, some results, like any other query. Um, you can update things. So this, this query here would update all of the colors and change them all to blue, uh, and adds it if it's not there. And you can do joins on it. So this would give me all of the companies that I have a, a red product. And so you, know, all, you have the full power of all the things you're used to in SQL, but you can access into your serialized column there. Um, but here, here's the killer feature. You can do an index. So this first one uh, creates a functional index on the uh, pulling out the color. And now you have, you know, when you do a query with Postgres, it'll use the index. Um, post, uh, the HStore also has a general index, which um, isn't as fast as uh, the, the one above, but it, you don't have to say it for each key that you get. And so there's some trade-offs there, but you can have it either way. And that's... Uh, I think that's really cool. You can have it today. If you have a Postgres 9.1 database, all you have to do is create extension HStore, and you have it. HStore has been out um, since 8 point something. I forget the first version it was in. But you'd have to uh, do some other things to, um, to get it. You'd have to like, find where the HStore SQL is on your machine and do backslash i. This is uh, you know, much easier. And you can have this in your migrations. Uh, Great news, Active Record 4 uh, is going to have HStore support built in. Uh, there's a, a patch you can bring it back to Active Record 3, but Active Record 4 has it, and you get to use it like this. So this is an operator I, I didn't uh, cover earlier, but this one would find you all the products, again, with a, a color and value of red, and that's, that's how you use it in Active Record. I think that's pretty simple. Uh, one of my colleagues wrote uh, a demo. You can uh, check this out, uh, hstoredemo.herokuapp.com to see it live, and then you can uh, fork the, the code behind it if you want to see a real live example of how to use hstore, um, thanks to uh, him. Uh, however, there is, uh, I'm really glad that uh, Xavier, I think yesterday, went on and on about SQL. I was going to, uh, I, I had my own loving slides of SQL. It's, it's fantastic. I, I do all of my apps in uh, SQL these days, and it, uh, it has HDR support as well. Uh, Jeremy, Jeremy, Jeremy Evans, I love you. Um, so what we use this for, so as a real, use, real world example of HDR, um, so we run the Postgres service, and part of that service, we check in on every single database several times a minute, and we ask it some questions. You know, how are you doing? Are you, are you up? Uh, how many tables do you have? How many connections? And so on and so forth. And we check in and we store that information. Now, over the, the course of the project, uh, we figure out new metrics that we want to check. We start checking them, and we figure out that other metrics aren't really that useful, so we stop checking them. And if we had to uh, do database migrations all the time, that, that just wouldn't be fun. And so this, we start checking something new, we just shove it in the HStore, and we have our observations. Uh, another use, uh, there's a, a tool called uh, Wickled D, which is a project in Go that just listens for your logs. And if you format your logs like this in a key value pair, it'll parse that and then just shove it into HStore. So that way you can uh, you know, just print to standard out and then grab these later so you can go through your logs afterwards. Um, and that uses HStore to store everything. Uh, so HDR is pretty good, but there is, as far as I know, no nesting. Like you can't have HDRs within HDRs, and it's only strings. And so one of the ways that we get around that is we have some naming conventions. So if something is underscore at, in Ruby we'll cast that back into a time. Or if it's number something or something size, we'll cast it to an integer. 
and so on. And you know, it, in practice, it works uh, well enough, but you know, it leaves something to be desired. Um, but the great thing is you can use it today. Uh, so next, I'm going to talk about something that you, you can play around with today, but I really wouldn't recommend using it in production yet, and that's PLV8. Uh, PLV8 embeds the V8 JavaScript engine inside Postgres. And V8, uh, for those of you who don't know, is uh, Google's V8 engine that uh, Node is built on as well, and it's, it's really fast. Uh, one thing that's great about this uh, for, for me is that it's a trusted language, so eventually I'll be able to offer this to Heroku customers. Uh, Postgres has a number of languages that you can embed, uh, such as like C, but we can't offer that because then you could run arbitrary C and that's not fun for exploits. But JavaScript is trusted, so we can run that. Uh, it's written by uh, Hitoshi Harada, and uh, it's been uh, maintained lately by uh, Andrew Dunstan, who's really cool. Um, here's the location of PLV8. Uh, installing it's pretty easy. Uh, I wrote a brew recipe, but I'm not sure if it's going to get merged because it actually has to install into Postgres. It can't install into its own thing. Um, but installing it yourself is pretty easy. Make install, uh, does it, and then you say create extension PLV8, and then create language PLV8, and you have it. Uh, so how do you use PLV8? I'm going to go to uh, one of my favorite examples of trivial programming, the Fibonacci. And um, it happens in nature. Uh, so this is Fibonacci written in PLPG SQL, and that's, that's ugly. Uh, all those capital letters, it's like yelling at you. Uh, but, you know, this, this is, you know, standard, naive Fibonacci. And it's, it's slow. Uh, so this is doing uh, 0 through 35 every 5, and, it, you know, uh, that's, that's a long time. Um, but it, it works. Uh, here's that same code in PLV8. Uh, it takes a, it's a, a make a Postgres function that takes a uh, integer and then it returns an integer and then in between the two dollar signs is just JavaScript and there's my function. Um, and it's pretty fast. Uh, I didn't want to stop there, I wanted to uh, cheat a little bit and memoize the function, uh, which, you know, it's, it's, yeah, sure that's cheating, but then it's really fast. Um, so that's cool. Uh, so how many of you guys know PLPG SQL? Okay, how many of you guys know JavaScript? Yeah, see, that's, uh, that's what I thought. Yeah, that's a lot more. So let, let's go back to documents. Um, so here, here's a sample JSON document. Uh, it has a name, an age, you know, some, some nested stuff. Um, I made a, a table that just has one column data, and I just shoved a bunch of JSON into it. Uh, here's the first seven. I, I made a million of them. And then I made this function here, get numeric. So it takes a key as a text, it takes data as JSON, it returns a numeric, and then all I'm doing is parsing the JSON in, in JavaScript, uh, pulling out the key, and then that's it. So what, what does that give us? Um, so now we can select age there out of our documents. And here's, you know, do a, a a statistic on it. There's the average age of all of them. Um, so the first one is JavaScript. The second one is if I just had a table of just age. So, you know, this is slower than SQL. Uh, but uh, when you do so sort of more advanced queries, this is a, a, this one up there is a common table expression, which is cool. I can't go over it now, but check out CTEs. It lets you define, um, like, subqueries and then do, do operations on the subqueries. It's really powerful. Um, so, but when you're doing sort of more advanced work, it's still slower, but the difference is much less. Uh, but one of the things you can do to make it faster is you can create an index on it. Postgres doesn't care that the index came from JavaScript. Once it's an index, Postgres knows how to deal with it. And so here I am in the second there, creating an index, and then all of a sudden the same query is much faster. And so for those of you who've used Couch, that's sort of the same trade-off, right? Where in Couch, you can make a one-off queries are slow because it has to scan everything. But once you make a Couch view, it's really fast. This is the same trade-off. Once you make an index, it's really fast. Uh, but Postgres can do something cool, which is uh, combine indices. And so I don't know, I'm not going to go over like how to read explain statements in SQL, but in the bottom here, it's taking those two indices for get numeric siblings and get numeric age, and it's combining them, making an and 
because it, it, once, it, once Postgres has the index, it knows how to do that. Combines the two indices, rechecks the one it has to, and then, and then goes. And th this is uh, good. So Postgres 9.2 is going to support JSON as a native data type, which is great. Uh, there's probably, we're probably going to backport that to, I mean, I don't know, but we, I think there's an extension that backports it to 9.1. Um, and so you can have JSON as a first class thing in Postgres. So what else can you do when you have PLV8? Well, what about mustache? So here, uh, you take your uh, function, uh, it returns text, it takes the template and the view, you paste in the 400 and so lines of mustache, and then uh, at the end there, just return parsing it, and you know, parse the JSON and then pass that to mustache in the template, and it works. And so here is I'm selecting mustache. The first thing is my, my template that iterates over my array, and I pass it in some things there, and now I have mustache in my database. Is that useful? I don't know, but you can do it, and that's cool. <laughs> um, uh, here's something that is useful. There's a project called JSON Select, which uh, lets you do arbitrary CSS uh, selector style queries on, uh, on JSON. And so, same exact pattern as the mustache one. Uh, this is, JSON Select is written to use either in jQuery or in Node. And so I just pretend that I'm Node, I make an exports object, paste in JSON Select, and then I parse my JSON, I um, you know, pass in the selector, and then I re-stringify the JSON so that I'm up here, instead of returning a numeric or something, I'm returning JSON. Um, you know, the same pattern as all the other functions there before. And now, uh, just to, to remind you what the, uh, the documents I'm working with, they look like this with some, uh, you know, uh, phone numbers. And you can select the uh, first name uh, if there, you know, there's more than one. You can select the numbers there, and now I have my return set, I have the names, and I have the JSON there of my numbers. And you can do just arbitrarily deep uh, queries into your, your JSON. And this is, uh, you know, better than the uh, Git numeric that I showed you before, because this, you know, you can do arbitrary queries. Um, you can also do, you know, the same thing. You can have uh, indices. So, see, I'm, I want to get all the ages of people who are 26. It's about 10,000, which is about right for, you know, the million documents, evenly distributed age. Um, the problem, though, is there's a lot of uh, rough edges right now with, with PLV8. I think, I don't think there's any more crash bugs. There was one. I think that one got fixed. But there's still some problems, like uh, sometimes what you get back is an array from Postgres, and that's sort of um, not so nice to work with. Um, there's other problems with uh, the data types and some things. So there's some rough edges. It needs to be you know, cleaned up and polished up before you know, people in general start using it. But I think there's a lot of promise. Uh, so here's a real bad idea. So here. I'm just uh, evaluating any JSON that, uh, or any uh, JavaScript that comes in and evaluating and running it. Um, so, so what can we do with that? Uh, we can do something easy, like just returning a new date. There it is. Um, we could take a very large number and turn it into a string, and it happens to be JavaScript. Or we can, uh, you know, go th actually iterate through our data there and uh, split it, sort it, and jumble up the letters. So this is, you know, ad hoc JSON in your, your SQL. Uh, I don't know if I'd actually use that in real life. It seems kind of dangerous, but JavaScript SQL injection. But, uh, <laughs> you, know, the, you know, there you go. Um, so what about Ruby? So PLV8 has, or, or HDOR has already seen, you know, some great uh, Ruby ad uh, adoption. Uh, PLV8 really needs uh, some work to make it all transparent. I've done a little bit in there, but if any of you guys uh, beat me to it, I'd be more than happy to, but um, this is sort of what I'm uh, experimenting with, something like this. Uh, if we make, just like the HDR operator, if we make that same operator for JSON select, uh, we can do something like this, where, where the cost is greater than 10. Uh, the, the problem is, is when you do, you know, greater than a 10, uh, you have to cast that into a numeric, uh, because Postgres can't do the greater than on a string, and so there, this is some of the rough edges of, you know, these Postgres is real tricky about types. It's, it's strict. Um, but, you know, this, this sort of works, and it's kind of nice. Um, 
So these are the, the ideas that I'm going over. Um, so we have is, you know, now we have friendly documents that, you know, everyone loves to use, but, you know, in a world-class database, which is pretty awesome. Um, but one of the, the ideas that I want to start thinking about and, and starting a, a conversation about is the locality of your, your data. So we've seen over time, like, you know, web applications were all in the, uh, you know, Rails place. And then we started pushing some more of the logic into JavaScript on the, server, on the client side. And, you know, that makes a lot of sense for some things where you do the work on the client side that belongs there. Uh, the same thing applies to your database. Sometimes it makes a lot of sense to do the work in the database. And I know I'm guilty of this myself. Uh, before, I was sort of, you know, tre treated my database as a black box and, you know, didn't really want to do anything there. I just treated it as a dumb data store. Uh, I was sort of buying into the idea that my ORM, you know, made my database agnostic. But I really think that the ORMs, that's really a selling point to get more people to use the ORMs. I'm never going to switch my database of a production app. You know, once I have a lot of data in there, that becomes too painful. And so might as well take advantage of the features that my database has and really explore that. And um, I invite all of you to uh, do that too. And so that's really all I have to say. Um, the slides are up there, and thanks.